Beard of the Dawn Podcast 2. Today, part one of a three-part podcast, The Michael Teachings, with spiritual teacher and author, Shepard Hoodwin. Every single day since when I awake, I feel the same, somehow I have changed, what do the people of the street? Yeah, made me feel it Somehow life is sweeter every day Somehow life is sweeter every day hey, uh, You've gotta find a time to change Gotta find the time to find this time to embrace The colors, fine lines and shades It makes this place, it makes this place great I'll embrace the change Whoa, 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 I'll embrace the change Whoa, whoa from beautiful Ashland, Oregon, I am Pleiadian Emissary of Light, Caroline Ra. Thank you all for joining me today. Welcome to Spirit of the Dawn. About a year ago, I discovered the Michael teachings, and I was immediately drawn to the work of my guest today, Shepard Hoodwin. Shepard is a wise and compassionate spiritual teacher and author who channels Michael, a causal plane group entity who teach about how we set up each lifetime here on Earth. Today, we'll be exploring the Michael teachings through an analysis of the chart that Shepard prepared for me. We'll learn all about my choices that I made to create my life here as Caroline, and the importance of the Michael teachings in experiencing ourselves and others as unique expressions of the Tao. I am delighted to welcome to Spirit of the Dawn my friend Shepard Hoodwin, Shepard, thank you so much for joining with us today. I am so happy to be with you, Caroline. Thank that, you for having me. Oh, I'm excited. Well, before we get started on my chart, I would love for you to share more about what the Michael teachings are and how you became a channel of Michael. Michael is a name given to a group of souls who teach from the causal plane. So obviously we're on the physical plane, but when we are in between our lifetimes, and sometimes when we're dreaming at night, we are on the next higher plane of existence, which Michael calls the astral plane. When we are all done with our physical plane lifetimes, we move to the higher levels of the astral plane, and then reunite with our soul family and move on to the third plane, which is called the causal plane. Michael is a reunited group soul or entity that teaches from the causal plane. They started working using that name in the 1970s through a small group of spiritual seekers in Oakland, California, and the initial channelings that they brought forth were published in a best-selling book called Messages from Michael by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough in the late 70s. She went on to publish three more Michael books. And more and more other Michael channels started uh, accessing Michael and teaching in their own way with uh, new books coming out. I started channeling Michael in 1986, and I have several books on the Michael teachings uh, myself. Michael is unique among channeled entities because they have brought forth an entire system with its own terminology, very much in the way that astrology, for example, is a system or numerology that has its own terms for things and, and its own way of framing how the universe works. Michael teaches that each of us, at the core of ourselves, is what they like to call a spark of the Tao, or a unit of consciousness in the all that is. In other languaging, you could translate that as we are all an eternal God being. And as such, we each decided that we wanted to have a particular kind of adventure that starts with incarnating in a sentient life form, in our case, the human life form, but there are a multitude of other sentient life forms in the universe that we could have chosen just as easily. So all of us here chose to be human. And this was a way for us to explore who we are. 
to find out more about ourselves and ultimately to discover more about what love, truth, and beauty are. So for the spark of the Tao, this is a great adventure. It's very exciting and it's very interesting. Sometimes people say, well, I didn't choose to be here. But from the standpoint of our core identity, we all chose to be here. We all chose everything in terms of our basic life situation. We chose to be here. And in making those choices, we had a number of specific options that we could have had. So most people agree that that we're souls or we have a soul. But until the Michael teachings, it wasn't clear to people that there are different kinds of souls. It's a little bit like if you need a vehicle, you have a choice between a subcompact, a compact, a sedan, a van, a <laughs> pickup truck, whatever. And there are all ways of getting you around, but they're different. They have different configurations with different strengths and weaknesses. It's the same with the soul. When you and I, as sparks of the Tao, decided that we wanted to begin this adventure, we had to pick a vehicle. And uh, Michael calls the type of vehicle the role, the soul type. There are seven roles that we had to choose from, and these seven are server and priest. Those are the two inspirational roles. In other words, those two roles are all about emotion, about um, love. Then there are two roles that are about expression, artisan and sage. And it just so happens that you and I are both sage souls, so we are communicators. We like to convey insight. It's a more intellectual way of being when you are on the expression axis. There are two roles that are about action, and these are warrior and king, and these are souls who excel at doing. There's one role that stands apart from the other six as more of a note-taker, observer, an assimilator, and this role is called scholar. So once we choose our soul type, what kind of soul we want to be, we gather together with a group of other souls, could be 1,000 to 2,000 souls, who will form our larger spiritual identity. You could say it is our soul family. And we form with our entity some goals. What exactly do we want to explore? here on this particular planet, Earth, through this particular life form, human. What aspects of all the myriad things you can do on a planet most interests us? So some entities will choose a theme such as uh, forming communities. Some will be very interested in scientific exploration. Some will be very interested in exploring karma and so forth. So the larger group has its theme, but themes, but you have your own individual themes, themes that uh, you particularly are fascinated by. So you get together as a whole group and you decide where you're going to uh, start incarnating. So at first... Your entity, this could have been 8,000 years ago in Earth time. It could have been 30,000 years ago. It could have been 80,000 years ago. Whenever your entity started incarnating, you probably picked a continent and a part of a continent and said, let's start here. And the members of that entity who uh, – where you might say first in line because of their mathematical configuration within the entity, we're probably going to be the first ones to incarnate there. And often in those earliest lifetimes, you choose uh, 
a place that's pretty easy. So you're not going to jump right into heavy karma, war, and misery, and, and, and uh, all those real stressful things, because you want to get used to the planet. You want to figure out how to operate this human body. It's not a given that you're just going to pop in and know, know what to do with those limbs and, and eyes and brains. You've got to get used to it. So quite often in those first lifetimes, which Michael calls the infant soul cycle, you're just getting acclimatized. And many of those uh, earliest lifetimes are quite a bit like what the Bible describes as the Garden of Eden. Because there's innocence, just like a newborn infant, there's no experience yet. And uh, if you have incarnated in a place where there's plenty of food to eat, you can just frolic, you can play with each other, you can just have sex and eat and, and live a very um, atavistic, simple kind of life. And as you do this, you gain skills, just as uh, babies gain skills through their play. After a while, after we have gained competence uh, in the early stages of the infant soul cycle, we start to get more curious about the outer world. And this is a lot like uh, the terrible twos, you know, when the toddler starts to be able to move around. Um, he or she uh, starts to make some mischief because uh, bliss or the Garden of Eden starts to be a little boring. It starts to look like the same old, same old. So they want to stir things up a little bit. So later on in the infant cycle, there's the beginning of karma. And karma is defined in the Michael teachings as any action that robs others of their right to choose where a debt is formed. It has to be significant. Now... In the beginning, it isn't devious or uh, malicious. It's just really more out of ignorance. You, someone, you know, takes something you want and you get mad and you hit them, just like children do on on the playground. They you throw tantrums. They don't have a lot of skills. Um, as it escalates, it could get to the point where someone gets really mad, doesn't know how to handle it, and kills someone. And then the game is off and running, the game of karma. Now, Michael makes it very clear that we could grow strictly through joy if we chose to. We would not have to form karma. We would not have to have misery and suffering in order to grow spiritually, that it is a choice. However, particularly because Earth has been such a, a difficult planet, and the human life form is so aggressive, uh, it has been uh, pretty much inevitable that human beings would grow a lot through karma. And that is what we've been doing. There's also been, for the last tens of thousands of years, a lot of astrological configurations that made the cosmic weather more on the, the darker and cloudy side, and we're starting to come out of that. So now we have, once again, a renewed option to change course and stop growing through much, so much through pain and suffering and more through joy. But that's a, that's a different conversation, maybe for another podcast. So anyway, the uh, infant souls start forming karma with each other and start uh, becoming more separated into tribes. There may begin to be tribal warfare. Uh, and part of this is determined by our species hardwiring. We have evolved as a species to have various uh, fallbacks to make sure that we survive. Without having to think about it, we'll survive. And one of these is loyalty to our family and to our clans. So you've noticed, for example, most mothers of newborns, without thinking about it, feel compelled 
to care for their children and want to and feel very connected, even if before birth they weren't feeling very maternal. Often something emerges, and the same with fathers as well. And there's also in most people a feeling of dedication to their larger family and to their community, their clans, uh, because that is necessary for the species to survive. This is not something that is part of the soul, because the soul is more inclined to love unconditionally. The soul, uh, at least, is trying to learn unconditional love, what Michael refers to as agape. But the body has these built-in hard wirings that are designed to make sure that the aggressive human form can survive in the presence of other aggressive human forms. And so part of our evolution is at first we inhabit this hard wiring and we act according to its dictates where our clan will go to war with another clan if we think our survival is threatened. But gradually, as we wake up in these meat bodies, we start to see other options. We start to understand that there are more evolved ways we could grow, that we could uh, use kindness, that we could use compassion, that we could negotiate, we could uh, figure out solutions that would work for everyone, that we could allow enough grazing land for everyone, that sort of thing. And this is part of, of how humanity is evolving at this time. So eventually these hardwired impulses lead to forming of larger civilizations. And this is the next stage of soul age or soul development, which Michael calls the baby soul cycle, where souls start to gather not just into their little tribes and clans, but into larger communities, and they start to build a simple societal order. And this is where rules start coming in. If you've uh, raised young children, you know around the age of two, three, four, there are more and more rules simple rules, yes and no. You, can, you may do this, you cannot do this, you're given some choices. And this is where souls begin to learn about more consciously making choices within some rigid uh, frameworks. Many people currently on Earth who like rigid, simple rules, such as the fundamentalists of any religion, are at the baby soul cycle. So they're still at that stage of development where they need it kept simple and clear. So for example, if you belong to a church that says, if you want to go to heaven, do not dance on Sundays. And you like that because you say, well, now I know what I need to do to get into heaven. I won't dance on Sundays. But then if someone in your uh, congregation or someone outside of it even doesn't believe that or dances on Sunday even believing that he or she's going to get into trouble then you may become quite outraged how dare you violate the rules you're not going to get into heaven and that's a really really bad thing this is how young children tend to view the rules they either flaunt them or they submit to them, but their world is quite black and white. They don't really have a nuanced understanding of how things work yet because they haven't developed enough. They haven't spiritually evolved enough to be able to understand that not dancing on Sunday was just one person's idea of what good or bad was. If we go back to the biblical Garden of Eden story, it was said that when people ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they lost the Garden of Eden. And this is another way of saying that when humans started living according to these arbitrary rules where they thought they knew what was good and what was bad, regardless of what the truth was, 
then they lost that innocence and that happiness. And so we all lost the Garden of Eden when we started uh, becoming rigid about right and wrong. Uh, in the Michael teachings, uh, which is a teaching, a set of teachings generally for older souls who are more experienced, Michael emphasizes that all is choice, that we're here learning to choose, that there are no bad choices because we can learn and benefit from every choice. In fact, all of humanity benefits from every single choice that every person makes or has ever made. We may have not yet gotten to the point where we figured out what we learned, but we must have experiences of all kinds uh, in order to have growth that we can harvest. So a more nuanced view of good and evil is that when you form karma, in other words, you rob someone of their life choices that don't belong to you, then that could be roughly equivalent to the idea of evil. You kill someone. You've robbed them of their life. That's evil. Michael wouldn't use the word evil. They would just say that you formed a karmic ribbon with that person. But dancing on Sundays, by no stretch of the imagination, is actually evil. And even today, where we think that we are such evolved creatures, if you look at most of the things that people get in a snit about, it's about their arbitrary ideas about what's good and evil and not the idea that many old souls have, which is, you know, you do your thing, I'll do mine, uh, just don't hurt anyone, do, otherwise do what you will. Most of them are about things like, well, it's evil for the government to put people on welfare, or it's evil to pollute, which it is, but because that violates other people's right to choose. But when it's framed in this emotionally charged way, then there's a lack of recognition that people, other people are at a different state of consciousness and that they're learning their own lessons. So Michael coaches us to just make the best choices that are ours to make and let others make the choices that are theirs to make. So if we are an environmental activist and we want to teach humanity that, hey, we're killing ourselves with what we're doing to the oceans, simply see what choices are ours to make and let other people make theirs. So you let go of trying to force others to change and instead you appeal to their higher nature. You show them the facts. You, you use your ingenuity to figure out how can I get through to this person? And you just do your very best without getting entangled in other people's karma. So for example, if someone else is polluting if you go out and you, you know, blow up their house, kill them, you've gotten entangled in their karma and you've gotten brought down to their level. And now you're stuck in growing through pain instead of growing through joy. But if you can just use your own creativity to see what you can do, to make that situation better and just do it, you'll actually get a lot more mileage. You'll do a lot more to improve the environment, to raise up the vibration of the earth than if you get tangled in other people's negativity. So the whole idea of choice is perhaps the most core part of the Michael teachings, that we're learning to choose. And the more our consciousness raises, the better choices we make, the more skillful we become at being human, and the more we can help others. 
So anyway, we're, we're in this baby soul stage where a lot of rules are being made, and this helps baby souls learn. Now, there are some rules that are more useful even to the baby soul than others, some that are ridiculous and arbitrary, but some that can be helpful at that stage. So we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, well, there shouldn't be any rules at all. They should just be reasonable ones. Now, if you look at baby souls in a Buddhist culture, you're not going to have those kinds of don't dance on Sundays kind of rules because the whole culture is set up with different belief systems. They're more laid back. They're more tolerant. That's built in to their culture for thousands of years based on the teachings of Buddhists, a Buddha. So we don't want to assume that every baby soul is a fundamentalist because that is not the case. You just don't see a lot of fundamentalist Buddhists of any soul age. So culture does play a part here. And some cultures have gotten stuck in some unproductive patterns uh, over centuries that is going to take some time to break out of. But you will find in all baby souls, whether they're uh, religious or atheistic or whatever, that they do like more framework, more structure than older souls, because that's what they're learning. Once they feel comfortable working within a societal structure, we enter the young soul cycle. Young souls uh, are saying, okay, I get it. I know how to work in society. Now I'm going to see how far I can take this to be as successful within the structure as I can be. And so this is where you have souls that will work very hard, even at something they don't particularly enjoy, because they have this soul-level urge to climb to the top, just to see if they can do it, just to, to develop those chops. It's a developmental push. And so the majority of the rich and famous in our world are at the young soul cycle. It is also true that there are more young souls on planet Earth at the moment than any other soul age. So you could not, by a long shot, say that every young soul is rich and famous. But a lot of people who have worked very hard to climb to the top, whether it's the top of their, uh, their parish, if they're a religious person, or the top of their corporations, especially for the warriors and kings who like the business world, uh, or the top of their nonprofit organization. It doesn't matter. Uh, there is that, that push to succeed, and that is perfectly normal at the young soul cycle. It does have a dark side. Everything has a dark side and a light side, or what Michael calls a positive pole or a negative pole. The dark side of the young cycle is that you can get so much into every man for himself that you feel very alienated from other people. And uh, the negative side of the young soul cycle has led to uh, our extreme disregard for the environment, for the earth, uh, this extreme exploitation of uh, less fortunate people, of indigenous people, etc. This is a young soul phenomenon, but it's the negative pole of young soul. So we don't want to buy into the idea that if you're a young soul, you have to rape the earth. That is only when things go to a far negative extreme. Eventually, when the soul has developed fully as a young soul, it's ready to move on to the next soul age, which we call the mature cycle. The shift from young to mature is the biggest change that any individual or any society can go through because 
Heretofore, we've been moving more and more into mastery of the outer world. And once we've got that under our belt, we innately, we naturally become interested in our inner world. It's very much like what happens when you hit adolescence. Uh, as a child, you're getting more and more competent in, uh, in, in handling your body, of society, etc., and so forth. When you hit adolescence, all of a sudden, there's all these new feelings coming up in you that you don't know what to do with. It's totally new. You uh, have sexual attraction. You have um, desire to become an adult. Your body is changing. You want to know your inner world. Your feelings suddenly become so important. And that is what happens in the mature cycle. So as we move into the mature cycle, we become more interested in the arts. We want to form uh, more cohesive societies that are not just based on rules, but that uh, allow for consensus and discussion and, and getting to know each other uh, on a, a deeper level. It's the time when the greatest artistic masterpieces are generally created, because this is the time of going deep. And many European countries have an average soul age of mature. And so you see this a lot in uh, Europe. You see it a lot in Mexico. Mexico is actually an older soul country on average than the United States, which is still functioning at six level young. So the United States is still more focused in the outer world. But... If you uh, hang out in Mexico with the people, you'll see how family-oriented they are, uh, that they're relatively not ambitious, that they, um, they really care about their community, they want to connect, they want to spend time with their families and friends. That is more a mature soul society. Now you have the evil drug lords who are no doubt young souls, uh, who are just trying to get as much money as they can, and, and they have a different soul impulse. But the average uh, Mexican is at the mature cycle. And you can look at all the countries of the world. You see countries like China and India, who were very recently at the baby soul level, just entering the young soul cycle, and suddenly... There's this huge expansion in their infrastructure, and they, they, they want to uh, make money, and they're getting into manufacturing, and people are striving. Their societies are changing a, a great deal. Now, once the mature soul cycle is completed, then we move into the final of the five soul, age, uh, soul ages on the physical plane, which is called the old soul cycle. And the old soul cycle is where you take what you learned in the mature cycle and you put it in a larger dimension. So mature souls are mastering you and me. And the old soul is mastering something similar, but it's you, me, and our larger context. And so the old soul becomes more philosophical, uh, maybe more spiritual, uh, but there are many young and mature souls who are quite spiritual, so you can't generalize too much about them. Uh, they uh, become more detached from the physical plane, so they become laid back. They became, become more casual. Uh, one of the um, amusing examples that Michael gives in one of the Yarbrough books is that the mature soul is becoming very discerning, and so uh, a mature soul who loves fine wine would never put a certain kind of wine with a certain kind of meal because um, it would offend their sensibilities, which is really important at that level. But the old soul increasingly is becoming so casual, they'll just drink what they want. And sometimes the casualness of the old soul will bother uh, younger souls because they aren't laid back in that same way. Now, 
some soul types tend to be more laid back than others. So artisans and sages are innately more fun-loving, playful, easygoing than, say, warriors or servers. So there's a lot of complexity on the chart, and you just cannot generalize too much about anything. But the different soul ages may have trouble understanding each other. It's especially true that younger souls have trouble understanding older souls because they haven't gotten there yet in their development. So a baby soul who so passionately and sincerely believes that if you dance on Sundays, you're going to go to hell, just can't understand why the laid back older soul um, is willing to do that horrible thing. It just doesn't compute because they haven't gotten there in their development. It's just like a three-year-old really can't understand the raging hormones of the 13-year-old. They're just not there yet. So Michael gives us this amazing framework for understanding the differences in human beings. And this can help us reach unconditional love for others because we know that they are looking at the world through a different lens. And it can also give us tools for better communicating with them. So if you're communicating with a baby soul and you understand that they need those rules, you can, rather than being an iconoclast and trying to destroy everything they hold dear, you can speak to them with respect for their rules and maybe frame your point of view in a way that they can understand. So this is a big picture of the Michael teachings. And now we can get into more specifics and talk about your specific chart. That sounds great. I enjoy that, Shepard. That was fantastic, all that explaining about the different soul ages. I guess it's important to point out that one soul age is not better than another. Yes. We have had an amazing time today talking with Shepard Hoodwin. I invite everyone to visit Shepard's website, summerjoy.com, to learn more about the Michael teachings and Shepard's work. A big thank you to all of you who have joined us, and much gratitude to Brian, Zach, and Synergy for the use of their song, Embrace the Change. I look forward to sharing part two of the Michael teachings with Shepard Hoodwin as this three-part podcast continues. In part two... We'll be taking a look at the Michael chart Shepard prepared for me and explore the choices I made before I began the cycle on Earth. Sending love from my home to yours, I am creating an emissary of life, Caroline Roth. <laughs>